What's up, Crossings Church? We are so glad you're here with us this morning. Welcome to church. We are going to be going through announcements, an awesome missions update from Daniel Me Seymour, and an incredible message on the book of Zechariah, brought to you by your very own Pastor Trev. Be sure to check out our YouVersion event every single week. Be sure to save it. That way you can access the content as soon as the sermon is over. That is deleted. So you have to save it so you can see your notes. Um, We also wanted to get a special announcement out to moms. We need your updated contact information. We are putting together a very special Mother's Day gift for you. But to get it to you, we do need your address. So to do that, all you'll do is click on the link within the Connect card. And that is on the YouVersion app app. So please, please, please be sure to get us your updated contact information. And last but not least, we want to say thank you to Crossings. You guys have been so generous during this time, and this ministry wouldn't be possible without you guys. So thank you so much for your generous hearts. Um, If you would like to continue to give, that is available to do also uh, within the YouVersion app. And now, here comes Pastor Daniel with our missions update. All right, thanks, Jasmine. Hey guys, just want to give you a quick missions update on um, you know what is going on with our missionaries, and we've been in contact with them to try and really see what we can do to support them and primarily be praying for them, uh, because as you know, COVID-19 is not just an American problem, but this is global. And so I wanted to give you an update uh, that we've been talking with Pappy Daniel uh, in India and really trying to track and um, see how we can care for Uh, the kids on the train tracks and uh, India did one of the most proactive uh, lockdowns on their entire country. Uh, Nobody could go out of their homes, businesses shut down, couldn't gather in more than five people and so as soon as they did that at the end of March uh, the restaurant and the food vendors that provided our packets that we take to the kids uh, that operation had ceased and so we are currently working with Pappy Daniel on ideas of how we can through different methods, get uh, food to these kids and just check on them and see because our volunteers that go to the tracks on a daily basis aren't able to leave either. Uh, and so while we're in the midst of that, we want to um, you know, ask you for your prayers that God would continue to open doors for us to meet with those kids and meet needs. Um, and he's shown up time and time again throughout you know, the last three years of caring for these kids. Every time we ran into a barrier, we as the church prayed and he showed up in ways that we had no idea Um, you know, no expectation, no plan of how God could see that through. So be praying with us. Um, We do have some hope. It looks like on Monday, some of the restrictions are being lifted in India and there will be some essential businesses able to open. And so we are hoping that through that, we'll be able to get back out there and see these kids. In the meantime, just so you know, Pappy Daniel in Kerala, India, across the country, Uh, is continuing to be active in his community and his Light of Hope mission. Uh, They are using their orphanage resources to feed the homeless and the needy in his community. He's working with uh, the local authorities and providing food that they can continue to take out. And so what we've done with our funds that we've continued to give on a monthly, uh, you know, monthly basis is we have given him permission to use that to continue uh, or for his Light of Hope mission. Um, since we're not able to feed the kids in Calcutta right now. But uh, none of that is possible without your continued support. And I just want to say thank you again. You guys have been such amazing givers, and it's been a privilege and an honor to do this ministry with you uh, as a body. And so we'll continue to keep you up to date. Please be praying, uh, and we will look for the best way that we can reach these kids and love them and, and meet their physical needs. Um, all the while knowing that God's big enough to, to continue to take care of them. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Daniel, so much for that awesome update. And if you guys will join me, we're going to pray before we jump into our, meet, our message from Trev. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much um, for your hand in India. Lord, I pray that you would continue to um, just reach those kids, God, that you would find ways to uh, fill their hungry bellies, God, but more importantly, that you would fill their heart, that they would know that you're what satisfies. God, I pray that for every single family involved with Crossing Church, that we would be um, just 
seeking you during this time, that we would be loving our families. Um, We would be loving the people around us, God, that we would be the light that shines for you during this time. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts as Pastor Trev um, preaches your word. Lord, I pray that we would um, hear from you. We would be listening to you, God, that we would be silent and still and know what it is that you have to say to us. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Crossings Church. I hope you guys are all doing well. I hope you've had a good morning already. Uh, some of you, you, you've gotten up at the crack of 10 a.m. and you're just moving around, but thankfully you don't have to get dressed up for this. Uh, some of you already had two cups of coffee and probably have done the equivalence of a day's work. So I'm glad all of you are here. And uh, we're d- continuing our character study, our character-driven series, and today we're in Zechariah. In fact, this is the last book we're covering, the last character we're covering in the Old Testament. And Zechariah is interesting because he's a new guy. And let me explain that. You've probably heard of the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Uh, These guys were considered major in that they had written a lot and they had spoke to Judah and spoke to Israel before the captivity. Then you have the minor prophets. And these guys are a little different. They're speaking to Israel and Judah after the captivity. And Zechariah was literally born in Babylon. He's born in captivity. He had never seen the temple. He'd never seen sacrifice. He'd never seen worship. But here this young man's called to go and speak to Israel, speak to the remnant that went back to rebuild the temple and encourage them to follow through and do God's work. I mean, we all know what it's like to be a newbie, right? Uh, a newbie's the new person and I remember basic training. I didn't know what to do my first day. If you've ever been in the military, you can relate to this. They're yelling, yelling, they're hollering, they're giving you rules you don't even know existed. And you just want, if you knew what to do, you would do it. But it's so confusing. Remember that first night when lights were out, if you could just hear guys sniffling through the barracks. Because everybody was unsettled. They were just like, I don't know what I just did to my life. I'm new here. Heck, if you've been to high school, junior high, remember that first day in junior high or high school, uh, where it's just terrifying. Or maybe some of you, you've just recently started going to church, and you walked into church, and you're a newbie there, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't know how this works. I don't know the rules. I don't know what to do. Can I say this? In a way, we're all newbies right now, uh, because in reality, we're walking into the unknown. Uh, We always have been, but when things in society shake like they've been shaken, we really begin to ask ourselves, what does tomorrow hold? So I want to kind of relate with Zachariah today. I hope I invite you to relate with me with Zachariah. Because the message he gave to Israel, a bunch of people coming back to establish something they didn't know about. There's some interesting things when the foundation of the temple gets set. One of the minor prophets records that there was such a celebration and the older people that had seen the previous temple were weeping and the new people that had never seen it before were rejoicing. What a mix. Uh, But I would say right now today that we're all kind of on edge because we're heading into new territory. So we're going to just take a brief look at Zachariah's life and the work he did and pick up some truths through that story. So Number one, I'd say this, uh, you probably don't know this, but Zechariah is one of the most quoted books in the New Testament. Uh, 50 some odd times, he's either quoted or alluded to in the New Testament. Very, very quoted. Uh, He is also um, a contemporary with a guy named Haggai. Name your kid that, I dare you. (laughs) Now, Haggai was known as the guy that just brought the stick. He, he brought the punishment. He was, I'm going to kick down the front door and tell you everything that's wrong with you. And Zechariah might be a little more like me. I'm the guy that's going to come and say, oh, man, come on. I know you're messed up, but it's not that bad. Well, Zechariah was more in line with that. And so we're going to look at what he says. And in chapter one, he comes at this situation um, with a message. And his message is this, turn to God. Let's read Zechariah chapter 1 this morning. It says, The Lord was very angry with your ancestors. Therefore, tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, declares the Lord 
Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Where are your ancestors now? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my decrees, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, take your ancestors, overtake your ancestors? Then they repented and said, The Lord Almighty has done to us what our ways and practices deserve, just as he determined to do. So the first thing we see with this prophet, pardon the towel. Whew. The first thing we see with this uh, prophet is, uh, his message in chapter one is return to the Lord and he'll return to you. Can I say when you walk into the unknown, when you're heading into a new endeavor, when you don't know what tomorrow holds, this is the perfect time to turn to the Lord. I know many of you guys have already done that. I've heard about people upping their Bible reading. I've heard of people in the church that are praying more, that are caring for others and asking God, Lord, what do you want for my life? But now I'm starting to hear, hear uh, Hollywood actors and, and big celebrities begin to ask these same questions. Maybe you've seen some of them in the news and in social media asking questions. Is God doing something? Can I say this is the perfect time for you to turn to the Lord? And it's not hard. Some of you say, well, what does that mean? Uh, I believe if we would humble ourselves and say, God, I'm putting my eyes towards you. I want to know what it is to please you to have a relationship with you, that's that very first step. We'll talk about the gospel in a little bit, but that's how we come to Jesus. He came to us first. Um, the Father provided a way for us to come to him by sending Jesus, and we'll talk about that more. So the second thing we see in Zechariah, he has eight dreams in one night. They may say, man, that is a serious pizza night. Eight dreams in one night, and he recalled them all. That's how you know it's God. So these eight dreams speak of Israel being restored, uh, Israel turning back to the Lord, and the promise of what will happen if they do this. But in the middle of that, there's a very often quoted verse that I want us to look at this morning in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, to look at the second thing we should do for newbies. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now, Zerubbabel was the governor of the people. It says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of joy. God bless it. God bless it. So, here we have, again, a very popular scripture. Again, pardon me. Whew. Very popular scripture that speaks of not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I'll tell you why this verse has some real importance if you look at what was happening in, in that day. The Jewish people came back from Babylon, and they were eager to begin to build rebuild the temple if you look at the book of Ezra you realize that they actually were making quite good success and after one year of work they ran into hard opposition when they run into this opposition the work on the temple just stopped nothing uh, would work right everybody began to build their own houses in fact that's what the prophet Haggai really had a problem with the Lord said through Haggai how are you living in fixed up nice houses and my house is in desolate ruin? And the word of the Lord came to this leader. I'm sure Zerubbabel was frustrated. If you've ever tried to make something work and you just couldn't, maybe you could relate to Zerubbabel. This was a guy that was tasked to lead a group of people along with the prophet Ezra to rebuild the temple of the Lord. And now the work has stopped and they were getting nowhere. He had to be frustrated. He had to feel at some point like this just isn't going to work. I feel like I'm just marking time. I can tell you what, it's easy to begin to feel that way in our lives. We've had disruption or we've had difficulties. 
or you've been walking with Jesus for a little while and you just seem to hit a wall and you're like, I am not making the progress I once made. I don't have the same joy I once had. I don't have the same victory I once had. Well, can I just repeat to you what the Lord said to Zerubbabel? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Listen, God's so good to us. He didn't just send Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He didn't just raise his son up on the third day to give us victory and hope. But he sent the spirit to live not just amongst us, but in us, to empower us, to embolden us, to use us. We're never alone. God's spirit dwells in us. And we live a life of victory in the Christian life, not by our efforts, not by our might, not by our power, but by the very Spirit of God. The Word of God says, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That the Holy Spirit lives in you. And when we feel weak, excellent. We need to say, Lord, I'm weak, but you're strong. When we feel in despair, we need to say, Lord, you're my joy. Why? Because God's Spirit lives in you as a believer. You're not going to find victory. You're not going to find strength by trying harder or doing a little better. You'll find it by relying on the Spirit of God. The Bible says, keep in step with the Spirit. Uh, we need to become people of the Spirit of God that recognizes His presence, that uh, comes to His Word in a confident expectation that He's going to speak some more deep to you because His Spirit speaks to your spirit. You belong to God. And it's not like joining a club. It's not just joining a um, group of people that believe the same thing. It is joining his body. And you're marked by the spirit of God. He lives and dwells in you. He's made you new. And we can have confidence that he's our strength. And that's what Zechariah was giving a message to Zerubbabel saying, hey, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Where God's spirit's at work, there's victory. And God-sized things get done. Then I want to talk about a real hope. In Zechariah chapter 9, he gives this prophecy. He's, prophecy. He says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. It's kind of, uh, how many know uh, what that's referring to? Some of you that paid attention in Sunday school growing up are going to remember when Jesus came walking in on Palm Sunday. Not walking in, pardon me, riding in on a donkey. Uh, here the king of kings, the one that created the heavens and the earth, uh, the king of the Jews, uh, the coming Messiah is riding humbly on a donkey. And this was prophesied that he would do that by Zechariah. Now we see why he's quoted often. Can I say there's this encouragement that Jesus has come. Jesus has walked this earth. Jesus has gone to the cross. Jesus has risen. But if we read on, it says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations his rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. So verse 10 is speaking of something that hasn't happened yet. There's this um, thing called prophetic perspective. So when Zechariah saw this vision, when he gave this prophecy, he saw this king that was coming on the foal of a donkey and this same king was going to rule from one end of the earth to the other. He is going to break the uh, bow of battle and his kingdom would be unending and everywhere. Well, we can say with confidence that hasn't happened yet. What's happening here is you see this a lot in the major prophets and the minor prophets. When they saw something, they didn't see gaps. You're saying, well, was he half right? No, he was 100% right. Uh, let me put it this way. How many of you ever have gone hiking? Uh, I've done a little bit of hiking here in Arizona, and I learned something. I'm from Illinois. Illinois, things are pretty flat there. 
Uh, we do have trees to get in the way, but besides the trees, it's flat. And you can see forever if you move the trees. But in Arizona, there are these things called hills and mountains. And I remember the first time I went hunting with a friend, and, and they're like, hey, you see that ridge over there? We're going to go get to that ridge, and we're going to set up. We're going to look for animals. I'm like, ah, piece of cake. So we go hiking, and we get up over the ridge that I think is going to be home. Nope. There's like three more ups and downs till I get there. Unbelievable. So if you know what hunting is in Arizona, or if you've hiked here, you know what it is to thank you to the place where you're going, only to discover that the peak you thought was so close actually has several peaks between it. Same thing with prophetic perspective. When you get closer to the mountain, you realize it's got character and depth. And right now we're between mountains. Verse 9 was that event, Jesus came the first time. Verse 10 is Jesus is coming, and we live in that valley called the church age. So we live in an exciting time. We have confidence because Jesus has already paid for our sins. He has risen. The Spirit of God lives in us. We operate on the principle of not by our might, not by our power, but by His Spirit. While we're waiting to hit this second mountain, the Lord's return. And assuredly, as the first mountain came to pass, the second is coming. Don't be foolish and think that, oh, it'll never get here. In fact, that's one of the signs that many people will say things like that. In um, Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 through 4, it says, Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights on the day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley and half the mountain moving north and half moving south. Again, this is something that's coming. We're talking about the Battle of Armageddon where the Lord returns that second time and sets down on the Mount, Mount of Olives and is there to deal <laughs> with stuff. Uh, listen, Zechariah saw some cool things. Jesus is coming, and there's this note of victory in this book that should encourage every believer. Now, what are some quick things that we can take from this? Um, number one is this. We're in new times. So if there were ever a period of your life that you should determine to turn to the Lord, you need to turn to him. Again, how can we turn to the Lord? It's through what Jesus has done for us. I've heard that it's said that it's as easy as ABC. To admit you're a sinner, to admit that you've, to turn to him means you've turned from him. To admit that you have a need. Listen, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I don't care who you are today or where you're listening from, uh, you've got a need. And that need can only be satisfied in turning to the Lord. Um, you have to believe that Jesus did come, that he did die on the cross for our sins, that he has risen. And then if you would confess that you need him, a simple prayer to say, Lord, I believe that you came, that you died, that you rose again, and I have a need for you. Lord, forgive me and come into my life. Lord, fill me with your spirit and make me new. Listen, God changes hearts today like he did in Zechariah's day and like he's done throughout history. He meets those who turn to him. Can I encourage you, I don't care how much you know about the Lord or, or how bad your past has been or how many mistakes you've made or how lethargic you've been, today turn to the Lord. The next thing I'd encourage us to do is trust His Spirit. It's a reality. If you're a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit of God residing in you. Pause, turn things off and recognize His presence. Begin to depend on Him. You're tired because you're trying on your own strength. And that's not good enough. He loves you. He says he cares for you, so cast your anxieties upon him. Uh, trust the Lord that his spirit is alive and active, and he loves you, and he dwells in you. And the last thing is simply this. Uh, in Zechariah, verse 9, Jesus has come. Verse 10, he's coming. Put your focus on him coming. Put your focus on what's ahead. 
I can't wait for the economy to reopen. That's going to be great. Can't wait till we can sit at restaurants and do normal things. We look forward to that. But whatever you may look forward to, I don't care what it is, make it be dim in comparison to looking for what God has for us in the future. He is coming and he wants us to be ready and excited. I want Jesus to come back and us to be saying, Lord, hey, there you are. We've been waiting. So I want to pray this morning. And uh, if you would, join me in prayer. And let's ask God to do a work in our hearts. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Uh, this morning, I pray that you'd help us turn to you. God, we turn. Lord, we, we confess sin. We confess laziness. We confess being absent-minded of you, Lord, and today we turn to you. Lord, you said if we would turn to you, you would turn to us. Thank you, God, for that promise. Lord, I pray today that you'd fill hearts with your Spirit. The Holy Spirit, we invite you to uh, refill and renew and strengthen us. Help us rely on you. Help us recognize your presence every day. Lord, let us operate in the strength that you provide. And Lord, give us an outlook that looks for you. Lord, make us useful here, but God, help us have a heart that looks forward to your coming. Let us be those. Bless your people, I pray. Lord, bless those that are sick. Lord, I pray for Mark Webb today. God, strengthen him as he's had surgery on his foot. God, I pray for those that have serious situations going on. Would you lift hearts and strengthen those who are in need in our church? Father, we love you, we thank you, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we love you guys. Hey, next week, this week, be reading the book of Matthew. We're going to talk about Matthew as a character. He was a tax collector, and but used greatly by God. So check out Matthew. Uh, start listening to it as soon as you can. Pretty big book, but you can do it. God bless. <laughs>